I said earlier about the better he speaks, but I know he's very, very nervous about this one. Um, and you know, the theme of, of the event tonight is um, thinking the unthinkable. And you know, I think it's, um, it's helpful because, you know, as we found out in the last few days, and as Andrew was saying earlier, um, real life is much better than fiction, much more interesting. The most ludicrous things happen even in the legislature. And so, um, to uh, sort of just extrapolate from the ridiculous that we see around us every now and again can be um, helpful in thinking about the future. Um, with that in mind, I went to see The Sound of Music the other day, and um, most of the people think of The Sound of Music as sort of a children's show, um, musical, a doe, a deer, etc. But actually it's not, it's a much more serious um, piece of work, really interesting. It was very well done, the performance in Hong Kong. It's also a really quite subversive um, stage show. It's um, only incidentally about uh, Julie Andrews or the Maria character who does all of the singing. Um, the core character is a Austrian naval captain who was a um, war hero and um, very uh, odd at the time sort of Austrian nationalist. If you think that by the time we got to 1938 when it was settled, there wasn't much left of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. It was a little bit of a, um, a, a rough state. But there were Austrian nationalists and he was one of them. So it's set just at the time of the Anschluss, which is when um, uh, you know, the Nazi Germany effectively um, took over or incorporated Austria. And, and it starts just before that happened, when um, Nazi activity in Austria was very vigorous and extremely polarizing. Um, you know, the view of the, the Nazis and their um, agents within um, Vienna was, was um, uh, or Austria, it wasn't set in Vienna, it was set outside of Vienna, um, was you were either with them or you were against them. Sounds a little bit like an early version of a United Front tactic. Um, friends were set against friends. Um, but the most obnoxious people in the movie, uh, or the stage show, um, were those who said, just go along, keep your head down, you know, they're not that bad really, the worst couldn't possibly happen, and then you'll survive and we'll come through it and um, you know, we'll have, have good times again. But in the end, um, you know, the hero of the story refused to join the Navy, um, and under the cover of the Trap family singers, who do all the singing, which the stage show is known about, escaped over the hills to Switzerland, and the family then made their way to the US, um, and, uh, and became a legend later. But what would have happened, apart from a lack of good music, if they hadn't escaped? Um, and it's that, if they hadn't escaped, that I'll um, uh, let Andrew take up the story of um, that in a slightly different modern setting. Thank you.
If you think today's, uh, uh, there are a couple of things I actually want you to do as part of uh, participation. The first one is at the end of this talk, I would like you all to try to handicap. Give me a probability as to after listening to my reasoning, what, how likely do you think genocide will happen or not? Uh, that would be very helpful for me. And two, if you think today's talk is entertaining, uh, please grab your friends to come over. As I always tell the uh, Kong girls, uh, my favorite bunch of females on, on earth, uh, that if your respective boyfriend slash fiance can live through and be or enjoy a Lion Rock Institute talk, that man must be marriage material. <laughs> Right, Roy? Amen. All right. But anyways, uh, we have a board. We don't have PowerPoints today, but uh, we have a board. So we're going to go low tech today. Uh, this particular talk was inspired by two things. The Lion Rock Institute over the years has had many, many, many different donors. And uh, if you are active at the Lion Rock Institute, like if you came to our events and stuff, you get to know a lot of different people from very different backgrounds. Um, and one of the, one of the uh, bigger supporters of the Lion Rock Institute, um, in about October, November, commissioned a report from me personally as to the cause of the Occupy Central movement. And uh, uh, this particular talk today uh, can find its genesis in that particular report. Um, and the second biggest source of today's report comes from my personal idol, uh, one Neil Ferguson. Uh, he's a Harvard Cambridge historian and uh, sometimes sensationalistic. People have a field day trying to tear down his work. But in his book, War of the World, he asked a very simple question. He asked, 20th century was mankind's most successful century. Uh, the average worker's wage went up four times, his living standards even more due to technological advances. And yet, 20th century was also a typically bloody century of mankind. Uh, man killing man reached astronomical numbers. But the question he asked was, why did those killings occur only in certain places? Why did Scotland not experience genocide? Why did it happen in Yugoslavia, and Ukraine, and Cambodia a few times? And from his experiences, it triggered something within me because the reasons that he cited, the ingredients of genocide, is beginning to appear in Hong Kong. Um, I, don't want to, I don't want to scare any of you, uh, but uh, if my talk today is convincing, I would say that because I'm, after all, a, uh, an investment advisor in Cantonese, it's Chagin uh, Yun. The tradable angle for this particular talk would be, of course, sell your Hong Kong properties. But, let's start. Now Ferguson basically identified three particular ingredients in order for genocide to happen anywhere. The first thing is something called empire in decline. Well, what does that mean, empire and decline? How is it applicable to today's 2050 Hong Kong? Hong Kong, obviously, according to uh, anyone here who's below the age of, say, 25. Oh, I see a couple of interns here. <laughs> but according to the older folks amongst us who were subjected to British colonial propaganda, Hong Kong's history started when? Interns. Any of the interns? When did Hong Kong history start, according to the British? Shout it out. Go on. Don't remember. You don't remember. <laughs> That's, That's the only thing I can remember. 1997. <laughs> All right, according to the British history, according to the British history started in 1842. 
And that was when a fellow by the name of what? In terms? Manja. Pottinger, right, yes. Even a street was named after him. He was the man who took Hong Kong, according to legend, against the wishes of London. In fact, when the telegram arrived to Pottinger saying, why did he take Hong Kong? He wrote back saying, do you want me to give it back? And uh, that was basically the first episode of some so-called empire in decline. But the empire in that particular era was the Qing dynasty of China. And when, according to Neil Ferguson, whenever you have the borders of empire moving, you would have the first ingredient of genocide. And 1840, of course, is an important date because that is when Britain took Hong Kong. And the second most important date after that is 1941. The Landlock Institute takes interns from all around the world. And in order to find out what education system they went through, one of my favorite questions is, how long was the Second World War? If they said the Second World War lasted eight years, they are Hong Kong, Hong Kong or mainland educated, Hong Kong especially after 1997. If they say the Second World War lasted six years, starting in 1939, they were educated in Europe. And if they said that the war lasted roughly three and a half, four years, they were educated in America. And in 1941, that was when the British Empire was proven to be, well, to have declined beyond repair. Because in 1941, the attack that you've heard of is called Pearl Harbor. And Pearl Harbor was supposedly happening on the 8th of December, 1941. But simultaneously, troops, the Japanese Imperial Army was crossing into Hong Kong across the Shenzhen River. And because Hong Kong is ahead of Hawaii in time zones, our attack occurred one day later. So it was on the 9th of December, 1941. And it was at that moment that, to prove beyond a doubt, the British Empire can no longer keep Hong Kong as part of its territories. Because it's proven. The three years and eight months of occupation, which the young people of Hong Kong no longer can cite, is the solid proof that the British Empire has crumbled beyond repair. So, if you were to talk about blood being spilt on the streets of Hong Kong, According to Neil Ferguson's theory, and in fact evidence, there was mass killing in Hong Kong as well because of the moving plates of empire's borders. So that was another episode, 1941. But after 1941, the most important date would be 1950 to 1953. are important because in the region a war was going on called the Korean War. Why is it important in today's uh, analysis of empire is that when Henry Pottinger took Hong Kong, the biggest challenge he faced was Hong Kong was extremely far away from Britain. You don't remember back then that even the Suez Canal was not opened yet. To travel from Britain you have to cross near Gibraltar, down the African coast, round the Cape of Good Hope, across the Indian Ocean, through the Malacca Straits, up the South China Sea, and back to Hong Kong. In fact, the home base of the fleet that protects Hong Kong is based in a city called Plymouth. And Plymouth itself is at the river mouth of a river called Tamar. In fact, the word Tamar comes from that river. And uh, Henry Pottinger came up with, well, facing the challenge of it being so far, his biggest challenge to run the eighth colony was to fill the civil service. And he had massive difficulty hiring individuals to serve the Hong Kong government. So he came up with three rules. These three rules, number one, is it has to be a no-tax uh, jurisdiction. 
The major income of Hong Kong government was land grant and all sorts of business licenses. The second rule is that it's a free port. Anyone can come and trade, including the enemies of the British Empire. And the third rule is to respect local customs. The rule that today, even today, indigenous people in Goma justifies having illegal structures on their thing. But these three rules are not, of course, it's some sort of enlightened policy from the era, from London. But it's also a very hard-nosed policy based on the fact that they just couldn't hire enough civil servants to serve in Hong Kong. They have no direct taxes, no income tax, no custom duties, no all these kind of other taxes because it was extremely expensive to levy these taxes. You have to hire a lot of tax inspectors to, to, to collect these taxes. You want to be a free port and let even the enemies of the British Empire trade in Hong Kong because you want to reduce the incentive of your enemies attacking you because you simply cannot post enough soldiers in Hong Kong. And the third rule of respecting local customs is that if you don't respect local customs and you start changing the behavior of the local Chinese, they will rebel. And you need a huge police force to suppress that. So, what happened in 1915-53? The Korean War was raging. And I remember when I was a child, I was watching a James Bond movie with my father. And my father said, James Bond must be fictitious. The reason why is that, uh, he said, if James Bond is so good, if MI5 and MI6 is so brilliant, why didn't they know Henry Falk was smuggling things into China despite the United Nations embargo against China? He constantly repeated that. And in fact, I repeated that because I am a very loyal son. <laughs> Until one day at the Lion Rock Institute's office, Simon Lee at the back of the table corrected me and said the British government are merely continuing the policy set down by Henry Pottinger. And 1953 is obviously 110 years after the founding of Hong Kong. Why are they still adhering to that rule? The reason is very simple. Because according to Neil Ferguson's theory of moving edges of empire, by then, the People's Republic of China could have marched into Hong Kong and have taken Hong Kong basically at will. Nothing can stop them. They have millions and millions of troops. How many self-defense force of the British Army was then in Hong Kong? They could have not possibly defended Hong Kong. But because of Henry Pottinger's brilliance, Hong Kong proved to be what well, Hong Kong as a British colony proved to be extremely useful for the existence of the People's Republic of China. That is the inconvenient truth. The inconvenient truth is that by 1950s, the path of all those countries in the Arab world, in Malaya, Singapore, all these countries, all their path, why didn't Hong Kong walk the same way? It was because Hong Kong as a British colony was kept in place by Beijing. It was Beijing's effort. In fact, in 1949, when Beijing declared, I don't know, it's not independence, right? What's, what's the word? Liberation. Oh, liberation, right. When, the, uh, when Chairman Mao stood up the, uh, the, uh, the Forbidden City and declared uh, the people of China can rise up, uh, can stand up, uh, the Hong Kong government this you can go back to the Supreme Court, uh, the Court of Final Appeal and check this. The Hong Kong government nationalized uh, the uh, then under construction Bank of China building next to HSBC headquarters. They just took it. And they also took a few of, this, of the uh, China airline planes that was parked at Kai Tak at that moment. They immediately telegraphed Beijing and said, congratulations on, the, uh, on your new nation. We have some gifts for you. And the uh, nationalist government uh, based in Taipei then filed for judicial review uh, lost to reclaim those assets. But it is London's diplomacy uh, to embrace Beijing to keep Hong Kong as a colony. And during the Korean War proved that it was useful beyond a doubt to keep Hong Kong as it is for the People's Republic. So, so far so good, right? So far we know why Beijing wants to keep us in fact, if you listen to one of our supporters, uh, Charles? No, Louis Gay. Charles Gay. The son. Louis, right. Louis Gay says that this particular use for China continues even today. The internationalization of the renminbi would not have happened without Hong Kong. 
Shanghai tried it. Because if you want central banks and banking institutions around the world to hold RMB, they can't hold cash. They can't hold $100 RMB bills and put it in the vaults, right? They have to buy something. So Shanghai tried to issue something called Panda bonds. Panda bonds? Right. Of course, no one bought them. Because if a company were to issue in Shanghai and defaulted, you can't sue them in Shanghai because you're not going to win. So they called down to Hong Kong, called up John Tsao, and John Tsao said, we'll give it a try. And the money-hungry Hong Kong bankers created something called dim sum bonds. And after that, internationalization of the RMB went through the roof. But after 1950-53, the most important date, of course, would be 1982. 1982 was when Margaret Thatcher most famously fell in front of the uh, great people, People's Hall, People's Hall of Beijing, Yaren Dai Wuhan. Right? It was transmitted all across the world, and the direct effect was the Hong Kong dollar fell from five Hong Kong dollar to one US dollar, all the way to 10 Hong Kong dollar to one US dollar within the span of two weeks. It was just massive capital flight. People would rather buy toilet paper than hold on to their banknotes. And during the negotiation between Margaret Thatcher and China, I'm sure a lot of you have heard the story about how Margaret Thatcher wanted to extend the lease of Hong Kong. And a lot of Hong Kong people, when they say, oh, Margaret Thatcher wants to extend the lease, must be crazy. China would never allow that. But if you were to think from the British perspective, which is, they could have taken the Hong Kong back anytime they wanted to. They kept it all the way to 1982. In fact, we negotiated negotiations in 1979 because the bankers are calling us because they couldn't extend the mortgage beyond 1997. 20-year mortgages would not work if you have not settled that question. So we initiated the question, of course. If they want to take us back, they would have taken us back. And even the British, the British played the empire game for over 200 years, right? So they know what is Hong Kong's worth and value as a colony to China. So that is not completely crazy. Margaret Thatcher was actually playing the empire game trying to get an extension of Hong Kong's lease. But she met her, she met her match in Deng Xiaoping. Deng Xiaoping recognized the fact that Hong Kong being kept as is is extremely useful for people to come to China. So hence, he came up with a very ingenious thing called One Country, Two Systems. And in fact, one of the things I drill my interns on is the first five clauses of the basic law. Because if you listen to the Chinese, or even the English, one country, two system, a high degree of autonomy, Hong Kong people ruling Hong Kong, basically is the first, second, third, and fourth clauses of the basic law. Gong is number one. Sorry, Yat Guo is number one, Leng Zai is number two, Gong and Xi is number three, Guo Zi is number four, or some kind of but it was because of Deng Xiaoping's plan. Hong Kong, as the outpost of British Empire, was supposed to be kept until 2047. That was when, supposedly, the edge of empire is supposed to move. But, unfortunately, As I said, the uh, biggest, the, the, the one single guardian of Hong Kong's way of life is actually the highest powers of uh, Beijing. And the reason why I said this is that, as I said, this particular talk came from a report that I did for someone about Occupy Central. And one of the questions that they posed me was, why is this different to 1967? 1967 had massive riots in Hong Kong as well. Why is it different? And according to my theory, extending from Ferguson's, is that in 1967, you basically had the entire bureaucracy in China losing control. The, entire, the highest powers of China, the Politburo, basically lost control of the entire bureaucratic machinery of China. And hence, the agents in Hong Kong went wild. You would have heard a lot of things about how the British suppressed the, uh, the, the, the rebellion and the riots, and how Zhao Yanlai signaled first to Macau and then to Hong Kong, that they're not going to take back these two places. But what you don't listen to, and what I'm, just, I'm merely speculating, is that I am very sure once one of the first government machineries that the Politburo regained was the foreign ministry. 
And once they regained control of that, they suppressed whatever activities was going on in Hong Kong. Because the highest powers, those who actually had to run the country in China, knew that keeping Hong Kong as a British colony was useful for them. And then they had to end the rebellion in Hong Kong. But because the most effective guardian angels of Hong Kong is the highest powers, we are in trouble. According to the girlfriend of Lee Ka Shen, Zhao Wai Shen, Selina Chow? No? Yes, yeah, Selina yeah. Chow. So, Selina Chow. Uh, when she did a press conference uh, a couple of months ago, and a reporter asked her, So, I heard your boyfriend is moving his company to Bermuda. Is he leaving Hong Kong? Oh, she, of course, said the diplomatic thing. No, of course not. But there was one particular line. She said, the people of Hong Kong has to get used to a new reality, which is that Hong Kong's GDP is no longer even 3% of China's. And you're able to use that particular observation onto this theory that I'm proposing tonight, is that if we require the attention and active participation of the highest powers in China to protect us, they simply can't give us the attention anymore. In Hong, Hong Kong in 1979, or in the mid-1980s, was 20% of China's GDP. Even at the handover, it was still 15% of GDP. Right? These numbers are roughly right. And now, all the way to 5 to 2 to 3%, President Xi simply doesn't have the time to call off the middle managers that is screwing up Hong Kong. And when you start eroding institutions that signals that makes Hong Kong British, such as the law courts, the, uh, the press, the police force, the, the civil service, etc., etc. Even without shots fired, the plates of empire is moving. And that, I'm afraid, is the hardest thing to change. Because when empires decline, it is a process of hundreds of years. And even if 7 million people were to stand united. The likelihood of resisting this particular erosion would be very high. So of the three factors leading to genocide, we have the first one, which is the border of empire is definitely moving in Hong Kong, or against Hong Kong's favor. The uh, second factor One driving force in Hong Kong. Only. Nothing else matters. And that is Hong Kong mainland confrontation. Chung Tong Mountain. In fact, if you want to boost sales, you can use it. And you ask me how. I would, I would do the Harvard Business School, I would provide you a case study. The one organization that boosted sales best in the last week using this particular force was the Hong Kong Football Association. When they simply said, oh, according to FIFA, we're simply known as Hong Kong, not China Hong Kong. Mong Kok Stadium was packed. So even if you want to sell football tickets, you can use Hong Kong mainland confrontation. I went to Ferguson. Jews, before Second World War, was most integrated in Germany. They had the highest intermarriage rate. They had people working together, uh, living together, the same buildings. Uh, they had, uh, uh, they, if, if a Jew, sorry, if a German was to live outside of Germany, his or her most likely friend is actually a Jewish person. That was how integrated Jewish population was in Germany. So even if your population is highly integrated, like Hong Kong and mainlanders are, we marry each other, we go to school with each other, we work together, it doesn't matter. Because he said, one of the uh, easiest ways to see if there's two ethnic groups is whether one group of individuals can easily identify the other group. Mainlanders try to identify Hong Kongers and Hong Kongers try to identify mainlanders. And in Hong Kong, the easiest way is language and the use of words. There is a singer, uh, a uh, Caucasian or white girl from America. She, uh, she 
she just she's the daughter of missionaries, uh, and uh, she was raised in a village in Yunnan. Her name is Chen Mingyang. I don't know what her name is in, 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 in English. Anyways, I had the misfortune of uh, of tuning into TVB <laughs> one Saturday night because my mother was watching it, and uh, Jade Solid Gold or in Bokamko was on. And uh, she was being, she sang a song called Bye Bye Bye, B U I B U I B U I. And the host asked her, So what the song is about? And she said, Influent Cantonese, this white American girl, said, Oh, this is what I in my year. My year, which is shopping. Shopping. So we had this white Caucasian girl calling shopping my year. It was at the same week that Mong Kok was cleared after the Occupy Central. Uh, 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 episode. And uh, I remember watching a press conference done by our chief executive, and our chief executive said, okay, now Hong Kong is clear, and I hope everyone in Hong Kong can get back to their normal lives, and the people in Hong Kong can go support the affected shops in that area. And the terminology that the chief executive used was Kaoma. Kaoma and Maya is the same. Shopping. But it is this exact difference that signaled which side is which person on. And in fact, the term Gao Wu, because not only is Cantonese and the usage of words important, but also the accent in which you pronounce the Cantonese. And that is also why Gao Wu is so sticky, to borrow a term from Sanmi. But that's the reason why, because it taps deep into that ethnic rivalry that exists amongst all of us. That is how Hong Kong people call mainlanders, right? The Germans called the Jews, well the Nazis anyways, called the Jews Untermensch, Untermensch. My Germans are very good. But Untermensch, subhuman. And you have, when you have an ethnic rivalry, you have a tendency to label the other side as non-human. They're not even human. They are, you know, pests. And so the, uh, the Nazi Germany used to have lots of posters calling Jews rats. And my dear friends, a lot of you are Hong Kongers, what do we call mainlanders? Shouting. Shouting. Right. We call them locusts. And on the other side, when you listen to a blue ribbon person talking about the yellow ribbons, what do they call these yellow ribbons? What? Dogs. Right, they call them dogs. Foreign dogs. Dogs that serve foreign masters. So both sides are now calling each other subhuman. And one of, the, one of the hallmarks, strange and ironic, but one of the hallmarks of this kind of subhuman view of the other group is that you treat their women. Sexual violence becomes an extremely acceptable Practice. Okay? So you saw the, uh, when the thugs from the Blue Ribbon side went down to Hong Kong, they didn't even think twice in sexually assaulting the Yellow Ribbon students, female students who were there. But conversely, if you were to look at the comments left online about people like Lan Cha Yang, you also saw massive degrees of verbal sexual uh, 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 denigration. So it's happening on both sides. But of course, because you guys are all smart, you would say, but we share the same DNA. Right? We share the same DNA. In Ferguson's book, he raised the, uh, the case of a Sarajevo uh, mass burial ground in Hong Kong, in Sarajevo. He said that uh, when they dug out those individuals, they can identify exactly who that person was. Okay? But, because races are so mixed in Sarajevo, they couldn't figure out which wave of killing that person died of. Whether it was the Serbs killing the Bosnians, the Croats killing the Serbs, they couldn't figure it out. Because racially, it was so mixed. And you were like, can that happen in Hong Kong? Yeah, sure. There is a singer called Zhang Ding Hin. Hin's Zheng. Hin's Zheng was someone who was born in China, born, born in Guangzhou, went to school in Guangzhou, then come to Hong Kong until the age of 19, in a business that has to be subservient to China because he's a singer. 
So if he was to be killed in ethnic violence, who do you think killed him? Do you think he would be killed by the Hong Kongers? That would be the most direct guess, simply looking at where he was born and where he was raised. But yet he was also one of the most ardent yellow ribbons there were during the Occupy Central movement. He went to singing ceremonies in bloody shirts and bandaged heads in support of the students. So if he was to be killed and to be placed into a mass burial ground, which side told can you even tell? So sharing the same DNA does not stop ethnic violence. <clears throat> so that we have the second ingredient to Hong Kong. The third one, economic volatility. Uh, Ferguson was relatively more iffy in this one. Said, you know, maybe mass unemployment, uh, you know, stuff like that. I mean, I would be more simple because I'm an Austrian school economist. I would say economic volatility is the end result of when there is a massive amount of malinvestment. When a lot of money has been lost by some or a group of individuals, maybe housing speculators, and then someone has to eat that loss. In Hong Kong, it was by the people who bought the houses and by the banks themselves, and the shareholders in a certain degree. In the US, it's it by people who are holding American dollars because they're printing a lot of American dollars. But when you have a lot of economic volatility, those gaobutu, those spontaneous protest groups you see in shopping malls nowadays in Hong Kong, if they were to occur in 2003 during the depth of the SARS crisis, do you think the shopkeepers and the shop workers at that time would simply shutter their shops? Or do you think they would grab the nearest weapon they have and chase after those troublemakers? So that is the third ingredient. So we have all three ingredients in place. How would it happen? Uh, today, well not today, a few days ago, was the 800th anniversary of the signing of the Magna Carta, right? Well, the first version of the Magna Carta, there was a billion of them. But uh, from the Magna Carta onwards, the entire focus the entire use of parliament is to limit the power of the executive, the king, and to make sure that whatever social pressure is stuck in a place, it would have a safety valve in parliament where different representatives can express those anger out into the public. And in Hong Kong, unfortunately, we have a situation whereby this particular anger is now being bottled up and bottled up. So, oh, and also because Beijing no longer, well, the highest powers in Beijing no longer have the time and attention to spend on Hong Kong, uh, the, uh, the two sides would have less and less forces in restraining them. The logical conclusion of the umbrella movement the umbrella movement itself is a logical conclusion that legal and peaceful protests do not get what you want. So what do you do? You create the umbrella movement, which is peaceful, but illegal. Right? But that didn't work. And Hong Kong people is, well, the, the uniting core value of Hong Kong people, no matter what branch of you are, is efficiency. Right? So we would do things until it doesn't work, or prove it not to work. So all these Democrats talking about, oh, so few people you know, protesting today, it's not because we've given up, but simply because we have realized that this particular method doesn't work in getting what we want. So what would be the next step? According to logical conclusion, if illegal but peaceful way of trying to get what you want doesn't work, you would try the violent way. So I foresee this with the uh, with Hong Kong has two things. Well, Hong Kong obviously lacks land, right? We don't have any land. But there are two things in which we have massive abundance of. One, money. Two, ideas. And if you were to put these two things together for illegal and violent ways of protest, 
I'll give you a scenario. With drones technology nowadays, and with recipes of making bombs widely available on the internet, imagine I hook up three vans. You know, those vans that you see every day? Right. I hook it up to a drone technology, so it's helped, I can drive it from like, my bedroom. And then I pack these three vans with explosives. And then simultaneously, I drive them into the Western, Hong Kong, and Eastern Harbor Terminal. Ah, uh, tunnel. And then simultaneously, I blow them up. If you were to think from a startup's perspective, an entrepreneur's perspective, what would be the business plan? How much would it cost? Is it technically not feasible? It's there. And if something was that, like that to happen, I have no idea where the battlefields are going to be. My, my guess, if there is going to be ethnic violence, it's going to be places like public housing estates, where a huge, a high degree of mainland population already exists, uh, forcibly living together with their neighbours because of the government's housing policy. But uh, if the police fails to restrain because the Hong Kong people no longer trust the police, then what's going to happen? In that particular scenario, uh, the best case would be the People's Liberation Army leaving their barracks and suppressing the violence. Because the police can no longer handle it. So uh, we have the ingredients. We already see the beginnings of you know, bombs being created in Psycho. Uh, we are already seeing the right ingredients together in place. So one final warning. In 1984, the Winter Olympics was hosted in Sarajevo. In fact, even until 1990, 1991, uh, there was a 100,000 people peace rap of all different races in Sarajevo calling for peace. And then one week later, exactly seven days later, Serbian forces started shelling Sarajevo with artillery and the killing started. So it can happen much, much quicker than you think. Especially on the question of economic volatility, which I would like to take a chance of plugging uh, our next Thinking the Unthinkable series, if there is a massive banking crisis in Hong Kong. Because if you were to ask individuals on the streets of Jakarta on January 1st, 1997, and simply ask them, how long do you think the Suharto regime is going to last? They would never say it's going to be gone within 24 months. But that's what happened. So just bear this in mind, we have the ingredients according to theory, and uh, hopefully we're wrong. But as I say, these are trends, tectonic plates. And even if 7 million people are united, it will be very hard to fight against. Right. So that's my suggestion. Thank you. Any questions? Team play China team. That's the question, right? Yeah. Well, could that be a spark? Uh, uh, yeah, and, and coincidentally, we did see it. All right, sure. I, I have shared this particular scenario on RTHK last week. Um, in fact, the November game is already too late. I will tell you a story. I'll give you a scenario. The scenario is this: two places sending their teams to play, with the dominant power playing at home in front of home fans. But of course, there will be one or two visiting fans going to watch, right? And the visiting fans become unruly because they hate the home, home side of the home country. Yeah? So what happened is, even, even though they might be one country, so what happened is that they start being unruly and because the home team's police want to keep peace, they go into the stands and start beating up the fans. Okay? And then one of the players of the visiting team sees this, gets really angry, and kicks the other side. Kicks the police officers, and all hell breaks loose. 
And this against the backdrop of a very contentious vote within the parliament of the government. I am not describing Hong Kong. I am describing 1992 Croatia. The team Croatia Zagreb played Red Star Belgrade. Belgrade is a Serbian team. Zagreb Croatia, of course, is a Croatian team. Croatia, Zagreb Croatia was playing in Belgrade. The fans got unruly. The uh, Serbian police beat them up. But according to Komen Fai, the actual police officer was Bosnian, which makes it even more ironic. But uh, the player playing for Croatia Zagreb called Zvnomir Boban, B-O-B-A-N, launched a flying kick into the Serbian police, and within one week, Croatia de declared independence, and hence the beginning of the Croatian stage of the Yugoslav civil war. Why did I say November doesn't really matter? Is because November is the date in which Hong Kong plays at home. I'm guessing at the Hong Kong Stadium. But in September, Hong Kong plays away in Shenzhen. So, imagine this scenario. Hong Kong fans sitting in the fans, sitting in the stands. The national anthem plays twice, once for them, once for us. And during both national anthems, there was booing, or perhaps Hoi Fu Ti Hong, that's getting some. And you see all the Hong Kong fans, even though they're not wearing yellow, so they're pulling out all these yellow colored umbrellas. They start getting unruly. They might get into, even get into fights with the Shenzhen fans. The police officers rush into the stands. All this being televised live in Hong Kong and China. Right? And then suddenly one Hong Kong player, I don't know who, maybe a white person, maybe a black person, maybe a person, <laughs> launches a flying kick. And this person gets arrested. Oh, there are lots of fans here arrested. What's going to happen next? But that's the scenario we're talking about. No, if, if war is the extension of politics, and sports is the extension of war. And so uh, we don't have this kind of uh, rivalry. But uh, if that was to happen, Hong Kong can be ungovernable overnight. I have no idea what's going to, how our reaction is going to be. You see that happening north of the border in Shenzhen. In fact, I think it's extremely stupid to play that game in Shenzhen. They should play in Xinjiang. They should play in Beijing, for one. <laughs> you know, the play in Shenzhen is basically asking for it. They are asking for Hong Kong fans to go. And in this particular backdrop, can you imagine, say, 10,000 people booing March of the Volunteers in People's Republic of China? But that's going to happen. We, it is going to happen. And I think only in Europe, where they have fans, section fans for visitors? Right. Uh, the question is that there is different sections of fans for visitors to get them out of trouble, right? Yeah. Um, well, first of all, we're talking about we're talking about the Chinese uh, crowd control. So it's not that <laughs> early at least. It's usually uh, not done very well. And uh, you know how Hong Kong people would buy scalping tickets, right? <laughs> so we were talking about a complete interspersal of fans. I have no idea how long the game is going to be. That's my point. I don't think China has Anywhere else in, well, only in Europe and maybe America. Right. The question is, you don't think even China even has the segregation of fans, right? Right. So, if, if, they, if they don't have that policy, so even I don't know what's going to happen. But the thing is that that is a particular potential flashpoint in which would make Hong Kong people extremely angry and violent. Because if all it takes is for that incident to happen, and then to have a local pro-establishment type saying, please respect mainland laws, and boom, that's it. You know, and then you might have people on the streets doing something. I don't know what they're doing. Maybe district council election. I don't know. No idea. You know, you would have that confrontation. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry. Uh, you mentioned that uh, Hong Kong fans are angry. Uh, do you think that Hong Kong fans are angry because of the fact that they would increase um, hostility from people in China towards Hong Kong. One of the ironies is that people in Beijing and Shanghai start to use very similar language about the migrants into their own cities. Mm. Um, and, and they were somewhat sympathetic to the views of people in Hong Kong because they feel that they're a bit of a microcosm of the same um, uh, issues that Hong Kong faces. So is there, and sorry I'm on the optimistic side always, is, is, there, is there a sliver of hope that, that Hong Kong might be at um, the vanguard of some of these changes 
but that they're changes that um, have much wider implications across the empire. Okay. Well, the, uh, well, the question is, the question is, Shanghainese and Beijing people also call individuals uh, coming from the outside provinces into Beijing and Shanghai. Look, it's too, you know, learning from us. We still the land guard and coined these terms. Um, and being optimistic, you know, whether we could bring the changes that keep them here safe, uh, the entire People's Republic. Um, I don't know. I mean, the thing is that it's just not only just ethnic rivalry. We're talking about the moving edges of, of empire as well. Because Hong Kong people are so reliant on the use of language and the usage of words and accents in, in signaling whose side you're on, uh, that unless you are someone on the other side, like Hinz Chen, who would above and beyond signal that I'm on the Hong Kong people's side, uh, that you'll be able very quickly. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, I would say that uh, the, the driving force of this ethnic rivalry is not only the coexistence of two groups of individuals, but also because of many different policies as well. You have the migration policy, which is still extremely reliant on a single way permit. So therefore, fueling this locust feel. I mean, if they were to flip it overnight back to touch base policy, if you have to swim eight kilometers before you have, you can get a Hong Kong ID card, and therefore new entrants to Hong Kong will be viewed with respect instead of trying to teach us off, then you know, maybe, maybe that can change. But this, it just, the wheels, the thing, that the machine is going in a certain direction right now in which it is so hard to change direction. But, um, is there any like, special racial There is, I mean, he, didn't, he didn't mention any numerical. That's one of the criticisms thrown at him. You know, what, 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 was there a threshold? We have 3% of the population, 5% of the population, 50% of the population. What percentage of the population? That makes you feel threatened. Right. But there is, no, there, is no, there is no hard and fast number. All I can say is that you are all smart people. Uh, the question is, is there, a, is there a threshold in which it passes as a percentage that it would create an ethnic rivalry? All I can say is that you have to look within your hearts. We all live here, right? We feel it. That's it. Yeah. The phenomenon. Right. I mean, the Lion Rock Institute has always been known more for its advocacy than its numerical research. True. But in this particular case, I cannot quantify to you the probability of ethnic violence, even genocide happening. But all I can say is that if the police force was to lose control, if something massive happens in China itself, and the central government can no longer govern Hong Kong, if something happens to China, basically you would have ethnic violence in Hong Kong very quickly. The blue ribbons and the yellow ribbons would be at each other's throats. In fact, one of the bloggers long game would declare Hong Kong independent. Immediately. And would go worldwide fundraising because there is a Hong Kong exodus in places like Vancouver, Sydney, London, right? If you were to raise money in those places, say you want to set up the Hong Kong Liberation Army, I guarantee you today that you can raise that money. People will pay you. But of course they're going to ask you, where's your soldiers? That's not. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like the soccer team, isn't it? You are hired. <laughs> right. You can't. Mercenaries. But uh, it is, any we, we, the, the Irish, um, the Irish scenario, because the Irish basically fought against the Brits for many, many years for, for home rule and then for a free state. I mean, home rule is basically one country, two systems, right? And when that failed, they declared they demanded full independence. And they had... And the, the, the biggest problem is, when you have all these ingredients in place, even though Ireland, the southern part of Ireland, was granted independence, 60, 70, 80 years later, the Irish Republican Army was still assassinating people like Lord Mountbatten, the last Viceroy of India, you know, a, a cousin of Queen Elizabeth. At the end of 1970s, early 1980s, they're still conducting terrorist attacks on people like Margaret Thatcher. You know, we are talking about a violence in which would not conclude in our generation. It will be our children fighting their children. I'm not being pessimistic. I'm simply stating what I'm seeing. The trend is not our friend. There are a lot of observers who said Hong Kong people uh, and the usage of violence is basically not their, their DNA or their blood. How would you respond to that? 
Okay, the question is, uh, some observers uh, would say that Hong Kong people have caused violence. We don't like using violence in our methods, right? All I can say is that you are very ignorant of our history. If you were to walk into any public housing estates in the 50s and 60s, you would see violence everywhere. Hong Kong people do not believe in violence as a method of operations. It's because the cost and benefit analysis. If the benefit does not outweigh the cost, then I'm not going to do it. And because of the British court system, unless barristers get even more expensive, uh, we usually settle our differences in court. So that is one of the one of the better things about Hong Kong. And if the court system starts breaking down, yes, you'll see you'll see more people resorting to violence. But, but I guess my question is more. more... Well, they do it, of course. I mean, the, the, the thing is, the, the, the thing if you from a cost benefit analysis. Would setting bombs off simultaneously in the three cross harbor tunnels achieve anything? I don't know. But then the escalation would then be, if I do illegal and violent things in Hong Kong and that doesn't work, should I try that in Beijing? I mean, you probably can see maybe extra security for individuals flying from Hong Kong to Beijing. Uh, you would see, I mean, it all depends on the benefit. If it doesn't actually, does it? I mean, Hong Kong people is very enterprising. And one of the hallmarks of entrepreneurs is that we will try things. And we will force, to use, uh, is it Karl Popper, right? We'll falsify the process. And, and, and uh, when someone is trying to do something anti-social, uh, the mental process would be, uh, firstly, probably might went through something by right? and the most important stage is to justify it. You, you justify your action by thinking about, okay, they started it first. No, the, the thing, the thing that's the, according to the people of Hong Kong, Simon says that you know you have to have the trigger, right? justification. Mm -hmm. All I can say is this: imagine the scenario. Imagine a scenario in which the Beijing airport was bombed, and there was a yellow umbrella left at the scene. Ask yourself, how would you feel? If you can, if you just imagine that scenario feels a sort of a, yes, even silent, you are being drawn into that ethnic rivalry and then moving into bed time. And trust me, if that were to happen and you see a yellow umbrella there, our Facebook news feed would be nothing but that chair, right? Of that particular iconic image of the blown up airport with that umbrella in front. Even if it's well, maybe, I don't know if it's an accident, really, or any of those are accidents, right? But I'm just saying, you know, even if you think, oh, this might happen to people living in public housing estates, not me, right? If that scenario was to happen, how do you feel? Because it's all driven by feelings. And that comes back down to the cost benefit. What is the benefit of Gao Wutin, of organizing a bunch of individuals to walk slowly over the streets of Hong Kong and being, have their head bashed by the police? What benefits do you get there? All you get is express your ill feelings. And imagine you have that individual who wants to express their ill feelings, who at the same time has money and willing and then the access to technology and information. It's not that hard. A lot of individuals seated here today bought properties five, six, seven years ago. How hard is it to take out a million dollar mortgage to buy three vans, explosives, and drone technology? Doesn't even cost a hundred thousand. I mean, maybe a hundred thousand. Use taxis are cheaper, right? right? Use taxis are cheaper. I'm just saying, it's all that. All it takes is just one group, and you have that group, and they fail. According to official report, the group in Sai Kung was discovered to have explosive material because they set up a bomb for test, right? And therefore, the neighbors probably called it a complaint, and therefore, the police broke them down. I don't know if it's one of those conspiracy theories false flags, in which maybe the CIA planned today to get more funding for the CIA. You know, it's all kind of theories, theories and all, right? But if you take the official version, even the official version is bad, because you already have the beginnings of these loosely tied, well, terror cells. Gun water is basically terror cells. Police cannot penetrate them because they operate on a what must happen. You know, they're closely knit, they trust each other, very hard to penetrate. There's no information regarding their cause of action. Instead of marching around a shopping mall, you have to plant a bomb. Would you know? I would. There's also uh, another question.
among the yellow ribbons. I think there's a, a group that advocates more radical action. Well, the, the question is, there is a, there are groups in the yellow ribbon camp that advocates more radical action. See, we haven't crossed the Rubicon yet, right? Yes, I didn't use, I didn't mature my actions. Uh, we haven't crossed the point of no return. I mean, we still use words and couch them like radical. I mean, when is the word armed struggle going to come out? Che Guevara. I mean, I'm very sure Long hair wears Che Guevara t-shirts not for his cigar smoking hands. <laughs> Unlike me. Right. So where's the Armstrong going to come? Funding. You're going to have the first generation of exiles. I don't know how this is going to unfold, but it would take a trigger, perhaps a football match, in which awakens that. The, the, pop, the optimistic scenario would be like Taiwan, whereby there is an outlet. So, I would say that the greatest, greater China politician or statesman in the last 30 years was Li Danhui. Because he created a mechanism in which this kind of violence did not occur. Right? And you can have that kind of mechanism bubble up. But can you see that kind of, you know, electoral reform happening in Hong Kong? When the, no one in middle management, in the joint liaison office, or in the, in the local establishment camp, would have the guts to push for universal suffrage. It will come from the top. It has to be someone like seven guys at the Politburo sit down and think, you know what, let's give it a try. If it doesn't come from the seven, the standing committee of the Politburo is not going to happen. But unfortunately, they don't even have the meeting time to discuss this at all. So maybe it would take three bombs going off in all the tunnels in Hong Kong to get them to sit down and say, you know what, we're going to take care of this. But unless they have that meeting to take care of it, the middle managers in the joint liaison office is going to keep going wild. You've got to understand one thing about the local establishment camp. The local establishment camp benefits every single time Hong Kong faces a political crisis. They get more funding. They get more resources. They get more heavy-handed uh, uh, help from the central government. In fact, it is in the incentives of local establishment types to create this harmony in Hong Kong. Because according to what I always tell my interns, public choice theories, right? What does public choice theory say to us? People act for their self-interest. Including, people act for their self-interest, including politicians. You know, why one fight? Why is there why one fight? Because there's this harmony. If there's harmony, there'll be no more one fight. And where's all, all these people with vested interest and their career vested in this particular activity will be gone. You know, so it, 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 all these players are now acting in concert, creating this unstoppable force on them. And that's why I'm so pessimistic. And that is why, according, you know, according to the top of my speech, the trading angle of this is to sell properties, right? And that's why I saw. In fact, I went down, I went down to the property agent, September 1st, uh, last year, after reading all the news report on the uh, on the August 31st ruling by the National People's Congress. Something is wrong. I just knew which is something my gut tells me something is wrong. But then after writing that report about the umbrella movement, that is the conclusion I came. At least don't sell all of it, but diversify a little bit out. Because Hong Kong property prices have risen a lot in the US, right? So, yes? I feel your, the cases you mentioned as uh, the Hong Kong as slightly different from Hong Kong. Like in Deutschland, in Germany, the Germans are, are home side and they are strong, and the Jewish are away and they are weak. But in Hong Kong, uh, Hong Kongers are at home side, but they are weak. <laughs> Does it change your conclusion? Well, we have the, the question is um, in Germany, Germans are strong uh, and the, uh, and the uh, Jews are weak. Mm -hmm. um, Perhaps even in Yugoslavia, Serbians were so strong, the Bosnians were weak, and so on and so forth, right? Now, Hong Kong, and Hong Kong is weak, uh, but the mainland is a strong. But how strong are they? How far are they willing to take? How far are we willing to take? We have the one thing that can buy all the weapons in the world. We have all the money in the world. It, all it takes is one crazy rich person to do this. There are so many volunteers now, right? Will you say they are from Beijing side? 
Who are we to excite? Yeah. The rich the, person? The rich person. No, no I, I don't think so. I mean, Li Ka Ching for one, I don't think is, uh, I would call him pro Beijing. I would just say he's very realistic and pragmatic. But, it, you know, it just takes one person who believes in that cause to make a donation. Not even much. Five million, ten million, you know, half of a mid levels flat. That's it. We're in motion. So. So the analogy might be to um, the earlier Sarajevo when uh, World War One was established, where you had um, you know, weak Serbians and strong Austro-Hungarian Empire. Right. Uh, the question is, uh, uh, my, Hong Kong might not turn out to be Sarajevo of the 1990s, but Sarajevo of the First World War, um, where the Serbians were weak, where the uh, you know the uh, the uh, the Austro-Hungarians were strong. Uh, yes, but even then, even then there was like waves of violence against each, each side. You know, it's not only just, I mean, even during the Japanese occupation of Hong Kong, right? You have the uh, people with the Japanese slaughtering the people with the British. And then when Hong Kong was liberated, I am sure there was lots of revenge camps the other way around. That is what happens when the edge of empire moves and you have ethnic rivalry. And on the, on the question of economic volatility, I, I honestly think that. Uh, that is the biggest question mark because we have unemployment at three point seven percent right now. Uh, but it, just think back; it's very hard for these interns, right? For Emma, for Lewis, for Jude, or even for Coleman, because Coleman's working life has spent has been spent uh, in the in zero interest rate environment. But you know, you think back the times in which I graduated, I couldn't get a job, uh, I couldn't go back to school. You know, the level of anger, the level of anger. So, all it takes is that one spot, and it will go off. And when it does, remember where you heard it first. And if it's not too late, if the Lion Rock Institute still exists at that moment, working for peace, make a donation to us. <laughs> and uh, I, I mean, you know, this is something I want to share. Uh, we wanted to share for a long time. So, uh, I hope it's not too far fetched. Is at least entertainingly plausible. Uh, and uh, if there's no other further questions, uh, that'll be it. Cool. All right, thank you very much, everyone. Um, thank you. Um, the, the pitch donations direct towards uh, Lawrence. Um, if anyone needs to pay, I'm sure Lawrence has sorted that out. Um, you know, food's still coming, so feel free to um, uh, stay and um, discuss further. All I can say is the Lion Rock Institute is, is dedicating us. We are pro free market, yes. A lot of our work is also trying to keep all those institutions uh, that the British gave us, uh, that, uh, you know, to keep it intact and working. In fact, if you were to go to the um, Running Mead, Runny Mead, that's where the American cars are signed. Uh, at the running need, you will see a plinth, a piece of rock, in which uh, they have made a 800-year uh, celebration plinth. And on it, you will see my name. That is how much I feel about uh, our shared inheritance of uh, British Empire things. But anyway, so, uh, yeah, uh, I'll, I'll mingle with all of you guys. If you guys have any questions, especially about donations, please feel free to ask. Like, how to donate? <laughs>